Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Wade Rausch, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition here on Google Hangout. Thanks for joining us today. The uh, theme we're going to be talking about today is broadly uh, intellectual property law as it is evolving in the internet era. And um, we're glad you could join us. So I'm, uh, I'm a technology and science journalist. I'm a, a 1994 graduate of the program in science, technology, and society here at MIT. And I'm also uh, back here in the STS program working on some initiatives relating to science engagement and science communication. And I think this is about the ninth uh, time that I posted one of these faculty forum online uh, alumni edition uh, webcasts for the association. It's been really fun. And uh, uh, this is the first time we've had a chance to engage in a subject um, relating uh, to patents and IP law and copyright and trademark and these kinds of things. Obviously, MIT doesn't have a law school. But that doesn't mean that a lot of smart people who study you know, economics or material science or physics uh, don't wind up teaching at law schools and doing great things in these areas. So we're lucky to have three alumni uh, this week who are uh, doing those kinds of things. And I'm going to introduce them briefly and uh, let them talk about what they're up to these days. Um, before I do that, though, let me just remind you this is an interactive forum. and it, uh, which means that uh, we're soliciting your questions, and uh, once we've uh, uh, heard from our panelists, we'll be we'll be having a discussion uh, built around your questions. So there's a form right below the uh, video window where you can type in your questions, and those will be sent directly up to a spreadsheet that I can see here at my desk. So I'll do my best to relay those questions to the panelists uh, as they come in. Okay. So um, our first guest today is David Abrams, uh, who is a 2006 PhD in economics from MIT and is currently a professor of law, business economics, and public policy at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And um, I think I'll just uh, let David jump in and then I'll, I'll introduce our other two guests uh, in turn. So David, can you Take it away and tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days and what your specific research focus is and uh, what you teach, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just first, thanks very much, Wade, uh, for the chance to talk to MIT alums. It's always great to virtually, at least, be back uh, on campus um, and, uh, and also to share this with my, my fellow panelists, Stacy and Tom. I'm looking forward th to the discussion. So I'm, a, I'm an economics uh, graduate of MIT and found myself uh, ending up in, uh, in a law school, which is a little bit unusual because I don't have a law degree. But a lot of what I study uh, is very related to the law. Um, today, we're focused on, on IP, and that is my major uh, area of research. But I also, uh, I also do a fair amount of work and have done a fair amount of work that's crime related and then other, including some corporate finance and a couple of medical related papers. Um, and that's the beauty of being in a law school for, for an economist like me and an empirical economist like me is that it gives me the opportunity to apply the economic toolbox to a, a range of, of fields. Um, but let me, I'll just briefly describe some of what I've worked on uh, in the IP realm, and it's really patents that's, that's my focus uh, within IP. Um, so one big question uh, is, and a very basic question, is just about duration of patents. Um, it's related to the overall IP incentives. Do longer patents actually incentivize uh, greater innovation? Um, so I wrote a paper looking at uh, a change in 1994 where the U.S., uh, ended up joining with uh, the rest of the world. This was part of a treaty that also formed the WTO um, and harmonized our patent system, which caused a change. And actually, what's important is a differential change in the amount of protection um, in patents uh, across fields, which allowed me to look at whether there was an increase uh, in patenting activity in fields that got relatively more 
protection. I found that it did. Um, now, whether it's optimal or not, we still don't know, but that's kind of one step towards, uh, towards answering that question. Uh, a couple more recent papers I think are probably going to be more relevant to our discussion today um, have to do with um, how we determine who, uh, uh, who gets a patent, especially when there's a patent race. Um, and there's a question, there are two main standards, at least there had been in the world, first to invent, uh, the individual who has invented the, the item first and can prove it by lab notebooks or other methods like that, or first to file the individual who gets their uh, patent into the patent office first. Um, the U.S. had been the last major country under the first to invent uh, regime, and we switched over to first to file as part of the America Invents Act, which was the last big patent legislation that went into effect uh, almost three years ago now. Uh, and uh, a colleague of mine, Paul Wagner, uh, and I wrote a paper using Canadian data to try to see what happened when they made that switch. They were the last big country to do so. Um, and especially we, we took a look at the effect on small inventors. Uh, concern about the American Invents Act was that small inventors were potentially going to be harmed. Uh, and we found that it, it did actually in Canada lead to a reduction in patenting among small inventors. I'm going to mention one more thing and then let my, uh, my colleagues speak uh, as well. Um, I'm also very hard at work on, uh, on a couple papers having to do with NPEs, um, non-practicing entities, also known as patent trolls, also known as PAEs, patent assertion entities. And this is a really hot topic nowadays. Uh, in the patent world, a lot of people think they are the death of innovation. Some people think they're not so bad. Uh, and I am fortunate to have uh, a great data set that uh, comes from some of the some uh, very large patent trolls and lets me look um, in an unprecedented way at what they're actually doing, um, where the patents come from, where they get licensed to, what their business model is, and ultimately we're trying to find out what the effect is on uh, on innovation when patent trolls enter markets. So let me pause right there. I've actually got another paper on pharmaceuticals as well, but I've gone on, I think, too, too long already. So I'm happy to talk more about any of this. No, this is no, great, this David. Is great, David. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. So, so there is, there is uh, a big, a big echo, echo on the line. line. I'm going to work around that. Around that. Uh, thanks, David. So I'm hoping we can come back to some of those issues in the discussion, and uh, I'm sure that uh, and I can already see some of the questions coming in uh, relate to these um, patent trolls and NPEs or PAEs or whatever you call them. And uh, and the America Invents Act, I think it was in some ways an attempt to roll that problem back, but may have backfired or may be backfiring. So maybe that's something we can come back to. So I'd like to introduce next our second guest, who is uh, Thomas Lizzie, who is... Um, an adjunct professor of law at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. And uh, Tom has an SB in material science and engineering from MIT. Um, Tom, can you tell us about what you teach at Duquesne? And, um, and I know that uh, you also have a, a law practice that focuses on internet law and in intellectual property law. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, in addition, I'm a, the in-house counsel for the X1 company. Um, the MX1 company makes three-dimensional printers and we were an early licensee and continue to be a licensee of MIT for the uh, three-dimensional printing technology. Um, yeah, at Duquesne, I've been teaching at Duquesne for close to 15 years now. Uh, I taught intellectual all, all the various intellectual property courses um, and uh, also taught internet law for several years. Um, so that's pretty much it it's for for my introduction. Okay, great. We'll, we'll come back and have you jump into the discussion then. Uh, our third guest is uh, Stacy Dogan, who is a 1988 uh, SB in economics from MIT and now is a professor of law at Boston University. And uh, uh, Stacy, you're doing all sorts of things, and uh, I can see from the bike behind you that you're a bicycle commuter, which I heartily applaud. Uh, <laughs> But uh, talk, to us, talk to us about what you're up to at Boston University and uh, what, what your recent research has focused on and what you're teaching. Great. Um, so after many, many years, I've actually been reconnecting a lot with the MIT community recently. Um, so among um, my 
roles as a faculty member. I've got scholarship, I've got teaching, and then I've got administrative um, initiatives. And one of the most exciting ones recently is that I've been working with some colleagues here at BU and at MIT on a partnership in which our students working under the supervision of a uh, clinical director are giving advice to MIT students um, on a whole host of different issues. Um, we actually have two phases of the clinic. One of them launched um, this year and another will launch next year. The first phase uh, is called the Entrepreneurship and Intellectual Property Clinic and it's giving advice to MIT students um, who have innovations or inventions that they're interested in commercializing and talking to them about sort of general strategy, um, entity formation, founders agreements and things like that. So it's kind of corporate transactional um, oriented. And then the next phase is um, dealing with risks associated with innovation which happen all the time at MIT. There have been a few um, notable incidents in recent years where um, those uh, mischievous MIT kids have gotten themselves into uh, legal messes and haven't really had representation. Um, so MIT is really interested in getting its students some um, good judgment and good legal advice um, ex ante um, so that they can try to um, you know, be aware of risks, try to reduce um, uh, legal risks. So that one the second phase clinic is going to be focused on um, minimizing risks and also on some policy initiatives on sort of law reform efforts um, to try to minimize the adverse in impact that the law has on innovators. Um, so for example, if you're engaged in encryption research, uh, there are a variety of ways in which you can uh, run into legal risks if you disclose your research um, and there are a lot of concerns about that uh, among both students and faculty at MIT and so we may be involved in some law reform. So I've been spending a lot of time on that initiative um, in the last um, year or so um, and uh, my you know day job, <laughs> my full-time job is sort of um, teaching and scholarship. I teach in the area of um, intellectual property uh, I teach a seminar on um, IP and the internet, I teach trademark law, I teach uh, IP law. Uh, I am currently teaching an undergraduate course um, dealing with research methodology and uh, my unit is focused on patent law and access to medicines um, in the developing uh, world. From a research perspective, um, my research has been primarily um, in the areas of uh, copyright, trademark, and right of publicity law, uh, though I have dabbled a little bit in the patent space. Um, and I've got a bunch of different threads, but I think for our purposes, the most um, pertinent one is um, a series of articles um, in trademark law and in copyright law dealing with uh, the legal responsibility of online intermediaries for um, acts of copyright infringement and trademark infringement uh, using their technologies. Um, so the first article I ever wrote um, involved Napster, uh, the file sharing service, and uh, the appropriate approach for uh, evaluating the liability of intermediaries like, labs, like Napster. Uh, more recently, I've focused on um, the liability of intermediaries like eBay um, and uh, Google for enabling uh, consumers to access counterfeit goods. Um, and, uh, you know, it's tricky. It's complicated and tricky, and the law is still rapidly evolving. So my research and teaching really um, explores those themes um, a lot. Okay, terrific. Well, we're glad to have all three of you with us. Thanks so much, Stacy, for that introduction. So we've got so many audience questions pouring in, I think maybe we'll just jump right to them. Um, and th they really overlap with my own points of curiosity, too. So um, we have a question from um, Joe in Cleveland, Ohio, who asks, um, what is a patent troll? And have any of the recent changes in patent law and or patent enforcement had any impact on patent trolls? So, and if I could interpolate a little bit, obviously the, the, the term patent troll is a little bit loaded and can and could mean these non-practicing entities. Um, 
or it could mean these these larger firms uh, such as perhaps intellectual ventures that make a business of uh, uh, trying to protect other folks uh, from from patent lawsuits uh, or um, or in, initiating lawsuits on their own. So um, people have different fears and perceptions about uh, what's been going on in the in the patent system. And to some extent, the America Invents Act of 2011 was supposed to uh, fix this. So who wants to jump in and talk about um, Joe's question and, and whether the recent changes are, are, are in fact helping to fix the, what's perceived as a patent troll problem? Well, I'll start, start off. I, I... I think among the three of us, I have the most patent experience. I've uh, practiced patent law for over tw for 20 years. Um, a patent troll is considered to be a person or entity that abuses the patent system by acquiring a patent solely for the purpose of uh, uh, enforcing it against um, persons who are unlikely to realize that they have been practicing the patent and therefore being able to squeeze, um, uh, say, uh, money or other, other things from these people. Um, these patent trolls have given intellectual property and patents especially a very bad name. Um, though I do, I must say that the patent system has always been subject to persons who have been uh, trying to manipulate the system for their own public gain. I pulled up an 1850 um, Scientific American article last week that was titled, What's Wrong with the Patent System? And it dealt with, to some extent, people um, uh, speculating on patents and things of that nature. Uh, and greed was the uh, basic underlying uh, fault that they, the uh, editor saw at that time, and that continues to be today. The people try to pull money out of the system, which they have really no uh, entitlement to. Uh, Non-practicing entities such as MIT and many educational uh, um, uh, systems uh, legitimately uh, obtain patents and enforce those and license those patents as a means of creating revenue for the uh, university and for uh, advancing technology. Uh, the fact that these, non these uh, patent trolls uh, abuse the system um, should not undermine the, um, uh, the, the goodness of having these other non-practicing entities. I'll, Turn, turn it over to Dave uh, for now. I think he's done more recent in, uh, research on the effect of the changes in the law. Yeah, specifically perhaps this change from uh, a first to invent uh, standard to a first to file uh, standard, right, David? That's one of the things you've been studying with the Canadian example and the American example. Yeah, it is. That is so. That specific change um, is, I think less targeted and probably less relevant to, to patent trolls than, uh, than another big issue, which is kind of individual or small inventors versus larger entities. Uh, that's what made that, it's what made, it made it take so long for the American Events Act to get passed and made it controversial was the concern that larger entities have got tons of patent lawyers uh, either on the payroll or firms that they work with regularly and therefore are going to be quicker from invention to the patent office and that smaller uh, entities or even individuals might take a while to get from their invention to the patent office and therefore by changing from the first to invent standard where that's what matters as far as who gets a patent to the first to file standard you are more likely to favor the larger entities and it does seem like that's what happened uh, in Canada, uh, when I looked at that, um, but there's there are provisions of the America Invents Act that uh, the other major provision um, is about kind of preemptive challenges to weak patents, and so that's that's something that people think might uh, having be having some effect or might start to have some effect um, in weeding out broad or weak patents. That's part of the reason why it's possible for entities like patent trolls to exploit 
uh, exploit the system because uh, there are some patents granted that really shouldn't be granted, and you can take advantage of that by suing or threatening to sue uh, all over the place. And so the thought is if we can somehow weed those out, the patent office is never going to be perfect at getting rid of all the good, uh, all the bad patents. But if you can somehow augment that a little bit by allowing uh, early challenges uh, by competitors, you can uh, maybe mitigate that a little bit. I think it's still, uh, I don't think there's very strong evidence yet that that's having a big impact. But I will say there has been a lot of discussion about legislation in the last two or three years in Congress post-America Invents Act that would be more targeted at abusive practices, and this includes um, things like fee reversals. Um, so if a, a patent troll sued and lost, uh, the, uh, the defendant would get their, uh, their attorney fees paid for. This idea is this would deter uh, trolls from, from suing. Um, and additional kind of barriers, uh, additional uh, procedural barriers that just make it harder for them to sue in the first place or they'd have to kind of, uh, reach a somewhat higher threshold before they can uh, file litigation. So the idea, again, is to, is to make things a little bit harder for frivolous uh, patent litigation to go forward. Now, now, first, none of this has actually gotten passed yet. And second, the tricky part with all of this is calibrating things correctly so that you are stopping the bad stuff, the stuff that's clearly frivolous, and there definitely is some of that. Um, if you've heard NPR stories or, or seen the um, uh, This Week Tonight on HBO, they've, they've done a great job of highlighting some of the really, really egregious examples. Um, but you don't want to go too far so that you scare off um, uh, uh, innovators and so that you also potentially harm uh, smaller entities that might want to inf might, might need to enforce their own rights. So I, that's kind of where I see uh, where I see things currently both with the legislation and, and, and the challenge to uh, to getting legislation right and I think we don't really know enough yet about how to calibrate things correctly. David, right. do you think um, eBay versus Merck Exchange has helped at all with, um, you know, reducing a little bit of the um, costs associated with trolling, or not? Um, yeah, I mean, so it's so eBay. So again, as a uh, a non practitioner, I might I, I know uh, practitioners have have very strong feelings in some cases about that. So I might let Tom weigh in uh, more, but. Um, yeah, my sense is it, it's it's certainly affected things, but I don't think it's I don't think it's impacted um, the troll uh, the situation with the the trolls all that much. Wait, wait, uh, could one of you jump in and explain what that yeah. case was about? Yeah, so a few years ago, this is, so the presumption in patent cases has always been that. Um, uh, if you have a likelihood of winning your lawsuit, then you have a right to an injunction. So you have a right to uh, prevent the infringement from continuing, which means that if you have a lawsuit against a party that is selling a product that incorporates your invention, uh, you can basically require them to stop sales and, and take their product off the shelf. Um, that creates tremendous power, right, by the by the patent holder and um, it makes sense to me that this isn't so much a troll issue as, as more of a um, problem with um, abusive patent um, uh, claims more, more generally and perhaps claims um, based on um, vulnerable uh, technology related patents. But the idea is um, if you have a right to an injunction, it gives you a huge amount of bargaining power. The Supreme Court a few years ago issued a decision in which it said um, you don't have an automatic right to an injunction um, in patent cases any more than you do in any other kind of litigation, and courts are supposed to consider a series of um, factors in deciding whether to grant injunctions or whether to award damages instead. What this has done is, let's suppose that someone, a defendant is selling a product um, that 
does contain the patented invention, but it's you know a thousandth of the value of the product, um, it gives the court the ability to say, yes, you were an infringer, um, but your damages um, are going to be um, more limited, um, and uh, the patent holder doesn't have um, the sort of threat of being able to um, shut down the sales of your product. Right. So obviously the legal system, the court system is helping to kind of shape practices and not just legislation. Um, David, did you want to finish your point about that particular case and its impact? Uh, yeah, just simply, I don't think it's had a, my sense is it hasn't had a massive effect on, uh, on trolls. Um, but it, I mean, there's still huge demand and huge uh, a number of different attempts at, at legislation. So I, th I think the sense, and again, I don't have I don't have great data on it, and I like everything to be data driven. So this is speculation. My sense is that um, if if anything, it's had a, a a relatively minor impact on trolling behavior. Okay, um, I'm going to jump back to Stacy with a question from Helen in New York and her question is what kinds of legal issues uh, do or could MIT student innovators see and and uh, for myself I might tack on to that question going back to um, the America Invents Act I mean when you're talking to, to students at BU or MIT who are trying to do startups and you're, you're trying to brief them about legal risks um, is the risk of an abusive patent infringement lawsuit one of the things that they're they're concerned about and what how do you counsel them and, and particularly in a time when the law itself seems to still be evolving yeah so um there are a lot of questions wrapped up in that question so so let me start with a more general question what kinds of um legal advice mit students seek um it's really um there's a whole range of different issues that they come to the cl to the clinic um, for advice about um the existing clinic is really counseling students who are really interested in um, commercializing uh, their ideas, right? So they might have an they might have um, a product um, based on um, a new um, app that they developed. Um, let's say two roommates developed in their dorm room, and they're interested in commercializing it. Uh, they come to the clinic and get advice about um, how to go about uh, moving forward. So conversations um, take place about um, how to manage their own relationship with one another, right? Which, what kind of stake each of the partners will have um, in a business that moves forward. What kind of entity they should form? Should they form a corporation? What kind of a corporation, a, a partnership? Um, so they have sort of preliminary conversations about how they might go about um, developing their business and then they get legal counsel um, uh, in connection with um, moving forward. So our students will um, draft articles of incorporation, uh, founders agreements, bylaws, non-disclosure agreements, um, things like that. The other cluster of issues or another cluster of issues um, that our second clinic is going to deal with is helping to raise awareness among MIT students um, about what the law is in this space, sort of what kinds of laws um, uh, exist relating to research and innovation, and um, so that they can go in with their eyes open when um, they're engaged in research or disclosure of that research um, that might raise legal risks. And an example of this is um, a couple of years ago, um, there was a group of students that in connection with a class um, was doing encryption research. Um, for those of us who live in Boston, we're familiar with the Charlie card, which is a um, card that allows us to get on the MBTA to um, ride uh, the, the T, the train. Um, these students looked at the security um, that was used in the Charlie card, and they discovered that it was um, incredibly weak, um, that all of the data was not stored in a central location. It was actually stored on the card itself. They figured out how to hack the card and uh, re, um, refill it, basically, so um, you could ride the T for free. And uh, they decided that they were going to... 
um, reveal their research and make a presentation at the DEF CON um, Hackers Conference. Um, and the MBTA got word of this and filed for a temporary restraining order against these students. Um, our clinic, part of the goal of our clinic is to provide a place that students, um, you know, at the time they're doing the research can kind of come to and, and um, talk about what they're doing and make um, responsible plans going forward. So maybe approach the MBTA ahead of time and say, you've got this huge security problem um, and work collaboratively, collaboratively with them to ensure that um, they are aware of the problem and um, don't, um, you know, respond reactively um, the way that they do. Basically, the idea is to try to keep students out of legal trouble um, as much as possible, so that um, uh, it, by keeping them informed about about the law. Um, can, can I ask you a question? Whether does that extend to situations like? Uh, Star Simpson, the MIT undergrad who wore the sweater that had some embedded LEDs at it to Logan Airport and then got the SWAT team called on her and had all sorts of legal trouble ensued. And just I just read an article by her not too long ago where she was not very favorable about her, uh, her how the MIT administration helped, well, or didn't help her. Um, yeah. It seemed like, you know, and that, and then Aaron Schwartz from a few years ago. Also, I think a lot of alumni think the administration has been dealing with this in exactly the non-MIT way. Is, is that something, or is that That's too far? exactly to right. So, so these are the cases. Um, there was a big movement um, on campus at MIT among both faculty and students. Um, there was outcry after the Star Simpson case, after the Aaron Schwartz case, um, that uh, we need to have someone who is going to be available to give legal advice to students. And um, it's not, um, you know, this is brand new, so it's not exactly clear to um, uh, how um, this clinic will um, represent students, you know, in what context um, it will represent students and um, so for example if criminal charges are filed against students um, that falls outside the scope of the clinic but the hope is that by providing both advice and representation of these students we can avoid that happening um, in, in many many cases. Um, so, um, so yeah, this is a response to the outcry after um, those incidents. Um, the administration over at MIT um, reached out to us. They're they're you know really looking to solve this problem, and I think um, they've been um, very committed. My experience um, in working with them is that they really want to make sure that their students are getting good counsel. Well, so, okay, there, there are all sorts of reasons why that sort of the hacker ethic at a place like MIT is is almost by its very nature going to come in constant friction with uh, the establishment and uh, including the legal establishment. Um, so it's probably good for for the institute to be thinking about how to um, deal with that, those, those episodes of friction. Um, I want to bring that conversation maybe back to, um, to intellectual property law, though. Mm -hmm. um, um, we've got a great question, um, really a proposition from uh, a viewer named Heidi in Israel um, who asks, why are trolls bad? Uh, they provide a market for patents, which makes it easier for small inventors to sell their patents. Beforehand, it was hard to find a buyer for your patent, and it was hard to go to court uh, to enforce your patent since that's so expensive. Trolls solve this. Who wants to respond to that proposition? I'll, I'll take that. Oh. All right, Wade. Uh, that, uh, sorry, Tom. Then Tom, I, yeah, go on, ahead. Uh, I want to get on it. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Okay, the um, let's see, am I is my own? Yeah. Um, okay, the um, as, as I mentioned before, it, it, the fact that it's a, a, a that the person or entity that buys the patent is a um, non-practicing entity isn't determinative of whether they're good or bad. What makes a troll bad? Is that they exploit the system just to, to drain money from the pockets of 
uh, companies, corporations, individuals who uh, who are basically uh, oblivious to the fact that they're using uh, technology. Now you've got to realize that patent uh, patents uh, patent infringement is what we call a strict liability uh, uh, tort. In other words, you do not have to have any understanding or under any knowledge that you are infringing to be liable. Now, if you do know and you do it willfully, there's uh, additional damages that will be uh, awardable to the patent owner uh, after upon the evaluation by the court or the jury. But what makes patent uh, trolls bad is that they have basically set out as part of their business plan to, to acquire patents which arguably um, or colorably, let's say, um, affect or uh, some other company's um, uh, products and they will go after those companies first with a cease and desist letter, letter saying you are infringing our patents and we will offer you a license please pay us X number of dollars. Now you've got to consider, realize that patent litigation is outside of antitrust litigation the most expensive type of litigation there is. And so generally speaking uh, for a even a small value patent, uh, something that's between, well, has a, a value between one and 25 million dollars, you are as a defendant going to spend close to three to four million dollars on the average for Protect, I mean, protecting your position, saying that you're not infringing. The patent troll knows this and says, okay, I will give you a license for $300,000 and I'll go away. Patent trolls often go after uh, companies that they think will give them that payment rather than give them a fight back. And after they get a couple of these lined up and then they can send their, their next letters out saying, look, you are infringing, uh, take a license for X number of dollars and I'll go away. By the way, uh, this big corporation and this big corporation have already paid this to me, thus it adds a, a, a gravitas to the letter and so this uh, creates a chain of, of, of compliant persons who are basically paying um, what we used to call strike suit money or nuisance suit money to these trolls. So as I said, trolls are bad because they set out to pull the money out of the system. Okay, uh, uh, David, why don't you jump in, but if yeah. you could answer the, the, the market question in the process, that would be awesome. I mean, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Heidi, Zoche Latova, that's a great question. Um, and I think, it's one, I think it's really central to the patent debate. I think Tom laid out kind of the, the legality and clearly um, clearly, uh, you know, that's an issue, but I think I, I look at it from an economic perspective. And, and you pointed out absolutely correctly that we have middlemen in every industry, basically. And there's a good argument that what you call trolls or NPEs or PAEs are just middlemen in the patent space. And exactly what you're saying, in some cases, they're, they're absolutely doing what you're suggesting, which is helping small... Uh, inventors either enforce their rights or maybe to produce uh, the product, the troll doesn't do it themselves, but maybe they facilitate transfer of the IP to uh, uh, another company that, that can produce the product and let the small inventor or company um, do the kind of basic R&D. I'm <laughs> under no illusion. What's that? So if I might jump in here. I well, think me, give me one more second, Tom, and then I'll let you jump in. So I'm under no illusions that, um, that this is what everyone's doing or even maybe a majority, but it's definitely some part of it. And what I think is often missing from the discussion here is, is exactly that, that there can be a useful middleman um, function of trolls or NPEs or PAs, um, and, and they get used in different ways and by different people. And so, Tom, if you're talking about something else, you just let me know. Um, but I think that's exactly right. And I think the question is, when are these entities acting as middlemen and productive middlemen, and when are they transfer helping 
facilitate the transfer of technology or helping uh, induce uh, smaller individuals or entities to invent? And when are they acting like hold up, what I call hold up artists, like exactly like Tom is describing where they're sending basically threatening letters that uh, based on IP that doesn't really have much merit. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. So my, my, the focus of my research right now is trying to answer that question empirically and trying to get some evidence uh, so we can't, so we don't have to have these fora again and again for the next 10 years. But so we actually have some data that tells us a little bit about it. And I'll tell you a little bit where this is still preliminary. We haven't even written the working paper yet. But one thing we're trying to look at is um, what happens. Uh, so are small entities more likely to sell to trolls? And we find, yes, they are. It's more likely that a small entity will sell than a larger one. They're also more likely to sell IP that's more likely to be litigated. So this this goes to the story that says that maybe trolls are kind of standing up for the little guy. Okay, let me, let me, David, let me stop you there and yeah. because we're running out of time. Uh, okay. Tom, did you want to briefly jump in with a response? Yeah, yeah my, my response is this. The, uh, I think you're, uh, you and uh, the general uh, media use the word troll too broadly to mean any non-practicing entity. Uh, okay. Yes, the troll, in my opinion, is just someone who comes in to squeeze money, uh, ill-gotten gains out of the system. The okay. non-practicing entity and also uh, law firms and other entities which are there to legitimately help small inventors and others to realize the, the value of their patents definitely should not be discriminated against. Yeah, them. okay. Okay, That's all right. Yeah. Well, so we've got about five minutes left, and I'd like to wrap up with a terrific question that came in from Brandon in Boston. And uh, maybe each of you could respond to this. So given the challenges facing the existing patent system, I'm going to broaden that to say the existing intellectual property system. Um, if each of the panelists was given the chance to redesign an aspect of the system, what aspect would you choose and what would you do to reform it? Hard question. That's like a big exam question. So I'm going to put you on the spot though. Who wants to try to answer that question first? It's hard to answer. With, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. It's hard to answer with respect to the intellectual property system. Um, generally, I'm not sure um, you know, what, what the step that I would take um, would be you know, what the biggest problem in the IP system is. I think each of us is focused on our own area of practice or of scholarship and um, I think there are um, certain concerns that each of us is grappling with. Um, so the concerns that I'm grappling with are important. I'm not going to say that they are the most important issue in intellectual property law. Um, for me, um, I have two um, from my own research. Um, one of them is that um, I think we need greater certainty. Uh, we've got somewhat greater certainty, but I think we could use um, uh, a bit more on uh, the relative responsibilities of IP owners and uh, intermediaries for sort of enforcement of intellectual property rights um, on the internet. I've proposed some tools that courts can use um, to um, uh, have greater. Um, certainty and you know that's a lot of the work um, that, that I've been involved in. Another piece of it for me would be um, in the trademark uh, space and the right of publicity space that we have a greater appreciation of the value that the public gets from a lot of unauthorized uses of um, trademarks and um, personal images. Um, other people need to speak so I could go on and on about that but um, but you know <laughs> no, that sounds fascinating. I wish we had more time to go into that, Stacey, but I, yeah, we do need to wrap up. So, um, Tom, what would your, your one big fix for the, for the patent system or the IP system be? Actually, I don't have a one big fix. Uh, what happens right now is actually uh, it, the best that humans can do. We have a system that over the years evolves. There's always going to be at the leading edge, there's going to be... Uh, these individuals who are very motivated by money and greed who find the loopholes that are existing in the system and exploit those before anyone else can fix them. And so eventually their actions uh, cause the rest of the system to see what they've done and then cause a fix to occur. So I think 
we just have to continue on. Patents are given up by each country of the world as in the last few years tried to harmonize the patents, their patent systems so it makes it much easier for the, uh, the inventors around the world to um, actually get uh, rewards for their creativity. Um, but this is always a progressive uh, system and we just have to look to see where, where the, the, the uh, areas of improvement open up as, as time uh, goes on. That's all. Okay. Thanks, Tom. David, you get the last word. Okay. Quickly. Two things. Uh, one, make it hard to get software and business method patents. These are part of the huge increase in, in patents uh, in recent years. A lot of them are crap. Uh, we should make it harder to get them. Two, shorten copyright. Copyright is insane. You can get a copyright on something for over 100 years now. I find it very hard to believe that the discounted value of revenues that you or your estate might obtain 100 years from now is influencing anyone to create more artistic works. So cut down copyright. Copyright started at 14 years in this country. 